Welcome to Millennial Pagan Podcast. I'm Autumn Wolf. And I'm Jared Stone. And as you can see, we got uh, Tasha with us back again. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well. I'm glad to be back. Thanks for inviting me back. Yeah. Thank you for coming back. A L- little, bit, little bit different than last time, but you know. So our listeners who are on their normal um, listening um, apps, we do have, again, another video over on our YouTube page. So if you want to watch my favorite faces or um, Jara's hair or <laughs> Tasha's beautiful face, go ahead and head over to YouTube and you can watch this whole entire episode visually as well as auto, audio. But um, otherwise, you can also hear it on your normal podcasting apps. Yeah. So how are you doing, Autumn? Um, I'm doing well. Um, work's a little crazy. We're going into the, the speedy season or the heavy work season for me. So uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Yeah, no, I I've, I actually uh, moved offices. Mm-hmm. I went from the dining room table to a desk in my bedroom. <laughs> Such a far move. I know, <laughs> but uh, but it's nice. I actually have three monitors now, so I'm I'm a lot happier. I, I can actually do have two screens for my work and watch YouTube. Oh, okay. I was about to say three's a little excessive there. <laughs> I don't know. I've kind of done this thing where I will sometimes move myself from my actual office in here and I will hook up my computer to our giant TV in the living room and I'll just sit there editing articles on the on the couch with this giant computer screen. <laughs> Yay! Oh, you have a lot of exciting news actually connected to Asatru and your practice and um, like doing it in mundane world. So I, if you want to share that. I do. So I recently started writing for Mimir as well, the Austria community's, um, their, their online magazine, which is amazing for me because writing has been just a huge passion for me, as you well, as you well know, because my blog is the reason why I'm here with you guys today. Um, but shortly after I started writing for them, they had me try out for the associate editor's position and I managed to uh, impress them enough with my editing skills that I am now the associate editor and writer. So check out Summer's issue uh, coming out hopefully soon. (laughs) (laughs) Got you. Uh, And I also got asked to teach a class out in North Carolina to a a group of three kindred that they're all saying um, about SAVE, which is kind of, encompassing my life right now is is uh just getting fully immersed in my spirituality and being able to have that in all aspects of my life which is amazing and i couldn't ask for anything more yay that's awesome that is awesome i'm sure a dream for not only us but a lot of our listeners and watchers mm-hmm. <laughs> have to yeah. get used to that yeah. I, I, i'm just i'm like feeling pretty lucky lately <laughs> So if you guys have not heard our first episode with Tasha, I do suggest going back and listening to that. It was a basic overview of what Asatru is. Um, Today we're going to dive into one aspect of the spirituality, which is the world tree. So um, Tasha, can you give us a like simple description of what the world tree is and then we'll just dive into it. So there's going to be a lot of very Scandinavian names and um so please bear with me i know that i don't pronounce all of them necessarily exactly correct but sometimes you'll trip over these words a little bit so the world tree is called yggdrasil uh, and it actually income it has three realms the upper um, or the top realm the middle and the lower realm and contained in those three realms there is a uh, there is nine worlds. Um, in the top world, there is Asgard. Ooh, <laughs> this is one of those words. The Yosalfheim, which is the realm of the light elves. Um, and then Vanaheim is also in the the upper realm. Uh, then the middle realm, you have Muspelheim, which is uh, the land of fire. Um, Midgard and Niflheim, which is the land of ice. 
Midgard is where we reside. It is another word for Earth. Um, and that's, and we're kind of nestled there in the world tree, like right there in the middle. Um, the lower realms are Jotunheim, Hell, and Svartalfheim. Um, and Svartalfheim is uh, kind of like the opposite of uh, Leostalfheim. Um, it's the realm of the dark elves, or um, depending on who you're talking to, dwarves. Um, so arguably you could say that dark elves are the equivalent of dwarves. So as much as uh, Legolas and Gimli like to argue, they're probably cousins. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that, um, it's just uh, the, the polar opposite of, of elf and dwarf. Yeah, so I, when I get into my studies, I find that, I find stuff like that extremely like fascinating. And I'm just like, hmm, I never really thought about it that way. So, but that's kind of the fun thing about doing all the research. Um, and then for places like uh, the Osulfheim there, it's also called Alfheim, which is a lot easier for me to pronounce. So I'll probably use that for the rest of this, uh, this podcast. Um, and so those, those are the nine worlds that kind of uh, reside in the world tree. There's also a host of creatures that um, I'll get into a little later uh, that reside in the world tree and kind of, they have their own interesting little, uh, little roles to play on the tree, which is kind of neat. I've, I've actually been kind of looking forward to this ever since I found out we were going to be talking about it. <laughs> yep. Um, one of our previous guests has the squirrel that likes to run around the world. Tree. Yep. Tattooed mm -hmm. on her arm. So I'm like, oh, there's more than just a squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Ratatosk is actually uh, one of my son's favorite uh, beings that live on the tree. He thinks that he's just the, like... He, he's he's about as mischievous as my son, that's for sure. <laughs> um, usually when he's getting a little too much like Ratatosk, I usually threaten to uh, summon giants from Jotunheim, which uh. used to work a lot better when he was younger. <laughs> he's getting too smart. Yes. <laughs> um, so I was just going to kind of uh, go into kind of giving a little bit of blip about each of the realms. Um, I kind of did a couple when I was listing them, but I'll go into a little more detail. And I think starting off with Asgard is probably like, probably. If, if you're gonna start somewhere, that's definitely the place Asgard. to start. Yeah. Right. So um, Asgard, <laughs> Asgard is the home of the Asir. And we talked about that in our in the uh, previous podcast, um, the Asir are like the big gods that um, that kind of rule over over Asgard. Um, there's a lot of halls. So in each realm, you have halls, or in most realms, because some of them are somewhat. Diff I feel like they would be a little bit difficult for things to live in. So. Um, but some of the more popular halls, like Valhalla, is in Asgard, um, where the Einherjar feast and get ready for Ragnarok. Um, and then you have Folkbang, which is Freya's Hall, which um, is kind of like, it's a very, it's not one that m many people are aware of. And you hear so many, um, people, they're like, oh, Valhalla bound and whatnot. And I'm just like, yeah, but if you die in battle, Freya gets the, you know, first pick of the half of the slain. So if you're a really great warrior and you're really impressive, you're, you have a really big chance of actually going to full thing, not Valhalla. But a lot of people don't like to hear that because Valhalla sounds so much better. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, it just, it just has, it just rolls off the tongue a little bit better. I'm going to Folk Fang. Uh, where? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so a lot of a lot of people get really hung up on the Valhalla thing, which is it's fine. Like it's a really great thing to uh, 
to shoot for, but also being aware that that's not the guarantee. Mm -hmm. um, but you also have Vlad's time, which is Odin's actual home. Like it's his hall um, outside of Valhalla. So Valhalla is where the slain live and Odin feasts with them every day, but that's not actually his hall. His is, his is the Glad's time. Um, you also have Bilskenir, which is Thor's hall. Um, and there's, there's just, there's just a great big, huge long list of halls that reside in Asgard, which is interesting, but a, like that could take up this whole podcast. So I just kind of like <laughs> explain <laughs> what Asgard is. <laughs> it, it's like, it's like explaining all the States in the United States. Yeah, no. Right. Um, <laughs> So in Valhalla, uh, not Valhalla, sorry, excuse me, in Asgard, um, they're surrounded by an incomplete wall, which is a really interesting myth um, and just kind of really exemplifies a lot of the gods. So if, if anyone's interested in hearing about that myth, they, all they have to do is like Google the you know the incomplete wall of Asgard and you'll get this really great myth. And that's also where we get Sleipnir, which is a little bit of a touchy subject for Loki. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is just this beautiful, fertile land where it, and Snorri Sturluson, when he wrote um, about Asgard, he wrote about it saying that it is more, it is more fertile than any other land. And um, so it's just green and beautiful. And, and essentially what, um, Christians would look like as like a heavenly paradise. Um, so the I feel like that's probably like the Norse equivalent of heaven. Mm -hmm. um, well, and I, I know that the, the a lot of the the ideology of it, like the imagery of it, it really was taken by Christians to to kind of boast what heaven would be like. Right, um, and then like I'll talk about later, it also kind of flips towards, you know, hell or Helheim, depending mm -hmm. on um, um, the person. They, you know, there's the two different ways to call it. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I definitely can see how, you know, Asgard is the top of the tree and hell is the bottom of the tree. And so I can see the Christian, like, trying to lure uh, Scandinavian pagans to Christianity being like, hey, look, we have these realms too. Mm -hmm. Kind of. <laughs> sort of. Here's a bastardized version of it. Yes. <laughs> We're just going to kick out six of them and go, eh, it's just three. <laughs> yep. Um, so then another realm that is is a really, we don't really know a whole lot about all time. Um, it's the home of the, real, the light elves. And the god that rules it is Frey. And kind of an interesting little tidbit of information, Alfheim was given to Frey as a tooth gift for cutting his first tooth, which is kind of the, the background to the tooth fairy. <laughs> so uh, Frey and his first tooth, you know, cutting his first tooth, he gets this gift. And so somehow it trickled down to whenever you lose a tooth, you get something under your pillow from a tooth fairy or a light elf, depending on uh, what you, what you teach in your household. <laughs> right. So um, to tooth fairy is Norse. Got it. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that I, I actually found that out pretty early on in my journey to becoming heathen. I'm just like, Oh, and a lot of things, in our life we don't really realize are from um, ancient civilizations and that was just kind of one that I definitely didn't expect. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, that but, does have an interesting original source piece. <laughs> yeah I definitely was fascinated by that for a while. Probably spent a little more time on it than I really than was really necessary but it was just such a fascinating thing that because it's so, it's such an ordinary, like, it's such an ordinary thing. Like, even people who don't have a path, they talk about the tooth fairy to their kids, you know? So, it's just such an interesting thing to me. That kind of shows how the, how the mystic can, can intrude into the mundane. 
Mm -hmm. Yep. And then um, another slightly interesting fact for all you Tolkien fans out there, Alfheim was actually the inspiration for the elves um, for Tolkien, which I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm a closet nerd geek. <laughs> And so, that, I mean, that, that, no. Open the door. It's Come okay. to the, the nerd side. <laughs> we are welcoming, at least us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just, I remember growing up and like the Lord of the Rings movies coming out and oh, like just jumping on the bandwagon with every other like 12 year old girl. Oh, like, oh, she's so dreamy, he's so cute. But yeah, they, uh, there is actually a historical inspiration for, um, for Tolkien, which was, interesting um to learn as well nice awesome so we got asgard we got i lost it all time and then we got another one over here right um yes that would be vanaheim and so vanaheim is actually a really uh it's the home of the veneer and not a whole lot is known about vanaheim um, other than the fact that um, after the Asir Veneer War, Frey, Freya, and their father Njord were part of the trade, um, which is kind of it, it's interesting because the Veneer traded three of their beings for two from the Asir. Um, one of those, one of the Asir being Mimir, which is a very very big person in. Um, in Norse mythology. Mm-hmm. It counts for two. <laughs> um, but so the veneer, and we did talk about the, the Vanaheim the last podcast. Um, they are, they were kind of, uh, I don't want to say lesser gods, but they were the gods of the people. Um, whereas the Asir would be more like the gods of like kings and, you know, whatnot. Um, they are associated with prophecy, which is also save, um, wisdom, and fertility, which most people, most common people would definitely want to have in their life. Mm -hmm. um, But that's, that's pretty much all we really know about Vanaheim. They don't really go over it a whole lot in in Norse mythology. which I think is a shame. I, I wish that more of those texts had survived, but I'm sure that most heathens have that same sentiment that we wish that we had more texts to study from, mm-hmm. um, but reconstructionist faiths and whatnot. Um, so going from the top realm, we go to the middle realm where we inhabit. We are from Midgard. Um, mm. <laughs> And so the way that it's viewed is we are, you know, Midgard is inhabited by humans. Yes. Um, and a lot of our land is surrounded by ocean. But when uh, Odin found Loki's children, one of his children got cast into the land of Midgard and lives in our oceans. And he's Jormungard. And so he's the world serpent that circles the world um basically like holding on to his tail and when you uh when sailors encounter these ferocious waves it's no like it's said to be the serpent thrashing around in the sea um but uh midgard is one of the one of the few realms that is specified in ragnarok as um Jormungand will rise up and um, join the battle and Midgard will be destroyed and rise again after Ragnarok. So we kind of have a very dismal outlook in Midgard as far as what will happen when Ragnarok comes. Um, But I mean, most of the world tree kind of has a semi-dismal outlook for Ragnarok, but that's true, yeah. Um, so that's kind of, that's, that's an interesting thing, which, which kind of makes me delve into Muspelheim. 
which is another the second of the uh, realms the middle and the middle realm um, so it's the realm of fire and it's where the the fire giant cert lives and he is the one that will rise up and and burn midgard in ragnarok um, which is you know, Marvel kind of got some stuff right, a little <laughs> bit. A little, little bit. Just a little bit. Like, um, Muspelheim is actually one of the two original realms or worlds that uh, came out of uh, Ganungagap in Gilfagin, which is the beginning of all things. So Ganungagap is what existed in the beginning and it actually translates out to the yawning void um so out of the yawning void <laughs> exactly like, you're, you're exactly. gonna make me do it <laughs> um, is it is it it's kind of like the big bang kind of actually yeah. around the time that i was um studying guilt beginning i started watching uh i think it was national geographics how the earth was made mm -hmm. and there was some uh reference to a ice asteroid hitting a fiery earth and creating life from that because it cooled the earth to like temperatures that life could exist and so it was kind of interesting to see how guilt beginning actually does have some scientific support oh. <laughs> but of course you know uh myths they there is a little bit of truth in water myths Mm -hmm. um, so Muspelheim is the, the realm of fire and um, the other one which uh, exists is Niflheim which I believe is the second one or the third one in the middle yes um, so Niflheim is the realm of primordial ice um, so that's you know uh, it definitely supports the whole fire and ice thing. Yeah, it's like um, like like they 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 collide and kind of went to the side. Right. So mm -hmm. what happened was in the beginning, um, Muspelheim and Niflheim sprang from the realm of Ganung Gap, um, and they eventually came and collided, and from that all life sprang forth, which uh, does have that like I said scientific evidence of. Um, of happening uh, oh. and it no one really is for sh like it's not really known how all the other realms came in ex into existence just that from like when Muspelheim and Niflheim came together that's when everything happened kind of like you said the big thing um, I, I, I kind of feel like like fire and ice coming together create you know creating the the world as we know kind of separating back out the steam kind of, you know, rose up to the heavens and the ash kind of fell towards the, uh, exactly. yeah. The and Lord. it's interesting because when you look at pictures of the world tree and the nine realms, you have Muspelheim and Niflheim and in the middle there's Midgard. Mm -hmm. And so that's where they collided, which is interesting um, when you look at it like that. So, um, so that's a really, really, interesting um little tidbit of information which i think is really cool because of the science of it all um, yeah but uh, one of the things that's kind of it's it's argued about a little bit is that hellheim actually is in niflheim which is interesting because it's also in the lower realm so for me that doesn't kind of add up so we have Niflheim and then we have Hell. <laughs> so, I mean, take what you will from that, but I kind of regard Hellheim as its own separate realm in and of itself for me personally, because mm -hmm. it just doesn't, for me, it doesn't like two plus two is not equaling that Hell is in Niflheim for me. So maybe there's uh, a gateway, like an easy pass from Niflheim. 
Yeah, that's the only way it can make sense to me is like everywhere else you have to travel the world tree proper and then but here they have a, they have a um train <laughs> world tree shoots and ladders <laughs> sponsored by fast pass actually i think i have a board game that's <laughs> like that but it's japanese so yeah. oh, one, of, one of the things to add to to my list of things to do is to create that board game now yeah <laughs> I, I i would play that yes <laughs> Um, so those are the middle realms. Uh, so just to review, that's Muspelheim, Midgard, and Niflheim. So then we have the lower realms, which um, it's it's actually kind of interesting um, because of the whole hell thing. Uh, so looking at hell as its own separate entity or Helheim, it is the land of the dead. Um, that were not killed in battle. Um, it's ruled by Loki's daughter, Hel. Um, and, you know, a lot of people, they think about the afterlife, and they're like, oh, it's either endless bliss or endless suffering. Um, and that's not really, there's not really a whole lot that supports that when we talk about Helheim. Um, the, the most common um, way to look at it is, your life in Helheim actually reflects a lot of your life that you lived in, in when you were living. Um, just without the presence of those who go to um, one of the other halls, the Folkbang or um, Valhalla. So you, uh, you end up living life as usual. Um, there are some realms of hell that are kind of a, a punishment section. Um, but that's for, that's reserved for like murderers and you know fill in the blank. Um, <laughs> Loki. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and I actually just recently wrote my most recent article for uh, Mimir's Well was actually an uh, an overview of Helheim. Um, my my column there is in into the halls of the gods. Uh, and so that's kind of like the first um, article in that series, which it just has a lot of really, really awesome information. Um, definitely invite people to check that out. Uh, it, it will go into more detail than the little blip that I'm allowing myself here. <laughs> right, of course. Um, so I definitely invite people to look at that. Um, the other... One of the other realms is Jotunheim, which I referenced earlier in my threats to my child when he's being naughty. Um, it is the land of the Jotun or the Jotnar. Um, this is also where Mimir's well is located, which is one of the uh, wells that waters the, the root of Yggdrasil. Um, <clears throat> and it's where Odin also sacrificed his eye for wisdom to Mimir's well. So he sacrificed his eye um, for a drink of the well because when you drink from it, you get wisdom. And what is Odin if not a wisdom seeker? And so his his task was what sacrifice is too great for wisdom? Well, none for him. So that's kind of uh, where that that's kind of Jotunheim's claim to fame. So now drinking from the well is different from when he drank from a chalice and then flew back as a bird to Valhalla and pissed on Midgard, right? That's a different yeah, story. It's a, it's a different <laughs> story. Um, That's how we have poets. <laughs> that, so that would be a whole other really, really cool topic is talking about the meat of poetry. Right. Um, there's definitely a lot of people out there talking about it, but glossing over some of the um, lesser things that Odin had to do in order to get the meat of poetry. Um, but it, it would definitely be an interesting thing to talk about, especially mead is such an awesome, like, I, I brew mead personally. I'm excited because tonight I get to go to the new Viking Mead Hall here in Flagstaff, the Drinking Horn, 
little, you know, little plug there uh, for my friends. friends. We have to go. Um, Field trip. I wonder if they'll just record in there. <gasps> I, I'm sure they would be more than thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm I'm excited. Like mead makes me excited because it's just got such a rich Scandinavian history. Mm -hmm. um, and I personally, it's like my drink of choice. If I'm going to, if I'm going to drink, I would like to have mead. And they have, they actually just released a really cool one. It's called uh, their lime mead, which I got some and I blended it and put it in a glass with some margarita salt and I had a meadorita. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so you're, okay. So now, now you're giving me ideas. I'm actually thirsty now. Boulders also <laughs> have a um, lemonade mead. Mm -hmm. Warning, it's mildly expensive, but it was very tasty, refreshing, very light. Worth it. Yes. That ah! sounds good. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, they have they have a lot of different meads there, and a lot of and they just have like a vast array of cocktails. Um, so little you know little shameless plug for my friends there. If you guys are, if anyone is in Flagstaff, please stop by the Drinking Horn. Evan and Halbjorn and Kelly, they're all great people. Yay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but, oh yeah, we were talking about Jotunheim. Yeah. <laughs> giants. <laughs> so it is the land of the giants. And um, another name for Jotunheim is Utgard, which you hear a lot in, um, in mythology. People talk about uh, a being called Utgard Loki that tricked Thor and um, one of their human companions in Loki. I can't remember the human to save my life right now, but um, it was, it's another one of those really just fun stories. Is that uh, the drag story? The drags. Oh no, that's different. <laughs> that's <a> different <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> I'll stop. That, I was just, that was just Thor and Loki. And that is also a really funny story. <laughs> Um, I, th I think we're gonna have to like have an episode that's just devoted to the the, the strange tales of Norse mythology. That oh, was, there's so many. There's so that many. Was an we yeah. thought this would be more structured. <laughs> that, that, that'll be like a, like a, one of those. Uh, I, I won't say Patreon exclusive, but probably like one of those like uh, special specialty shows that we do yeah, in the near future. A special. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so moving on from Jotunheim or Utgard. Um, we have the last, the last world, um, lo and located in the lower realm of Spartalheim. Gesundheit. Thank you. Spartalheim. 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 Yeah, it's, it is a, it is definitely a Gesundheit worthy, uh, <laughs> word, but it's, also the land of the dark elves or the dwarves depending on the person um although i really like like i said earlier i really like the idea of the dwarves as the dark elves because like you said the polar opposite of it all is just amazing mm -hmm. height weight <laughs> like abilities agilities the ability to grow facial hair <laughs> massive amounts of facial hair which None of us here would know anything about. Oh, no. No, not at all. Luckily, not me. <laughs> or me. Yeah, despite the fact every time I go get my eyebrows done, they're like, and lip too? I'm like, no. 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 Oh, no. Leave my peach fuzz alone. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. <laughs> um, so one of the cool things about the dwarves is that they are the master craftsmen. And... Um, so in Spartal time, they have mines and forges, which kind of is another big thing in my life right now. We recently bought a forge for my house. Ooh. So we are going to be like definitely uh, offering, you know, making offerings to the, the dwarves because forging is hard. Upper it body is. strength. Hooy. I actually, uh, yeah, so just like. I actually have a have a friend. He uh, he's a he's a professional blacksmith, and uh, he, we used to work at Rawhide together. He was actually the 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 blacksmith there, and just going in and seeing him do all this work, it's just it is. I no, I wouldn't be able to do it personally, but I mean, there's well, it's like the, the constant swinging of the hammer. Yeah. I'm just like like I'm, I'm just like. Oh. 
My roommate watches a um, YouTube channel of a um, blacksmith mm. and just watching that, I'm like, yeah, whoa. <laughs> Too well, much I'm personally really wanting to learn, like I'm not necessarily interested in learning how to make knives. Mm -hmm. um, I'm more interested in learning how to forge Damascus Mjolnir's like my uh, necklace. Mm -hmm. um, just, I feel like it's going to be fun and I just love the look of Damascus and uh, um, so forging is really, really hard and I can definitely see why dwarves would be the masters of that part. Of <laughs> yes. um, but some of the really cool and notable items that came from Spartal time uh, are Mjolnir, um, Skidbladnir, which is um, a pocket ship that always has favorable wind. Um, and when I say pocket ship, I mean it's a ship that you can fold mm -hmm. and put in your pocket. <laughs> I'm just like, I want a ship like that. Yeah. <laughs> Hold on, let me get it out. Whoosh. <laughs> let me just shake it out right here, air it out a little bit. <laughs> um, so that, the, the cool thing about that ship is that it, d it doesn't matter what's going on, you're always going to have a favorable wind in your sail. Um, and I believe that Skid Vladimir belongs to Frey. Um, and then another really cool item that comes from um, Spartal time is Gungnir, which is Odin's spear. Um, it's another, that's also kind of cool, it's another one of the totems that people wear, like people who are specifically devoted to Odin and not necessarily heathen, um, they are more likely to wear his spear instead of a Mjolnir. Um, and it's just, it's, I mean, it's a very powerful spear. Uh, yeah. gifted to Odin by the dwarves. Um, and then one of my favorite things to come out of Svartalfheim is Gillenbursti, which is Frey's golden boar. And that's literally, that's almost a literal translation of Gillenbursti. Um, he is Frey's golden bristled boar. And I just, I'm just like, why? Why would that how, how would that even be useful? But it's a really cool thing <laughs> um, right. to, to get at, I don't know. I'm just like, how do you, how does, uh, how do the dwarves craft a living creature? I'm not sure. They managed to do it out of gold though, so. Magic. Yeah. Yeah, magic. <laughs> so we're actually gonna take a short break here and then we're gonna come back with the creatures that run up and down the world tree. Millennial Pagan Podcast is exclusively supported by Patreon. Listeners like you can gain great benefits from your favorite show, such as... At $1 a month, you get a personalized shout-out at the end of the next full-length episode. At $5 a month, you receive a thank you card in the mail with a Millennial Pig and Podcast button and sticker enclosed. Additionally, $5 a month supporters have access to our monthly 30-minute minisodes. Patreon supporters are also the first to learn about new and exciting updates to Millennial Pig and Podcast. More benefits and exclusive content to come all right we are back and uh so we we kind of talked about the about the tree and the realms as a whole now we got to kind of go into the tree a little bit and talk about the, the little critters yeah my hair is going all over the place <laughs> um so so what are the what, what are the the critters that like to go between between realms on the tree so there's a lot of there's a lot of creatures on the tree um Odin does say in uh, in the Grimness Small uh, that there's a bunch of snakes at the root of the tree. Um, the the most well known one there, which could either be translated as a serpent or a dragon, is Nithog, and he nogs at nogs <laughs> gnaws <laughs> at the roots. Um, of the tree and so he is the he is the only serpent or dragon um depending on your translation that is named uh, so that's that's at the base and then at the top we have an, an unnamed eagle um he's wise he sits atop the tree um 
and on his beak there is a hawk that perches there and his name is Vedfolfnir. Okay. And he is the highest being because he perches on top of the uh, eagle's beak. I, I just I just got the, the just this weird imagery of like just like a regu- like a regular size eagle and a regular size hawk just perching on his beak. I'm like, wait a minute, that that doesn't look right. How does that work? It doesn't work. It's so yeah. weird. A bald eagle and a Harris hawk almost. It's still uncomfortably too much weight. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm just like that eagle must have some amazing neck muscles. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there is a connection between the eagle, and Nipog, um, and his name is Ratatosk. Mm -hmm. And he is this mischievous little squirrel. He is a messenger, and he actually does carry messages from the gods, from the gods to the other gods, um, up and down the tree. But he also likes, so there's this, uh, the eagle and and, uh, Nipog don't like each other very much, and Ratatosk definitely does his part to inflame that relationship. Um, <laughs> Hence the mischievousness. <laughs> yes. Uh, so he will take, he will carry insults from Neathog to the eagle and from e- the eagle to Neathog. <laughs> and so they just, they have this very antagonistic relationship and, and uh, Ratatosk definitely does nothing to make them think any better of each other at all. Um, Eagle says them. you're Eagle says you're a jerk. Hey, hey, snake down here. He says piss off. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, so that's that's kind of that whole relationship. Although Ratatosk, he's he's very he's depicted as one of those squirrels with like the long ears mm-hmm. with the fuzzy tufts at the end, which makes him ridiculously adorable if you didn't know that he's kind of a closet jerk <laughs> i'm handsome you're an animal <laughs> exactly and he's like he's got red fur and that's kind of the, the that that's our depiction of him that's every picture ever of ratatosk is going to be this cute little red big ear tufted ears squirrel and you're just like oh and then you find out about him, and then you're just like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but then uh, the other creatures that are pretty well known are the four stags uh, that eat from the branches, um, and they try to eat the the leaves, and and they gnaw on the branches at the top of the tree. Um, they have some very so two of the names are actually the same names as some of the dwarves, and that's Valin and Dane. Mm-hmm. And then the other two are uh, Dunair, and this one is the hardest one, is Durathror. Okay. Uh, and so they eat from the branches. They don't really do anything to harm the tree, but they don't really do anything to help the tree either, I guess. Um, so those are some of the most well-known creatures that live on the tree. Uh, there, I'm sure there's so, so many more, but those are the kind of main ones that live on that tree. Mm-hmm. Um, and are the uh, stars of the show, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> Got you. I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, Ratatosk is, is the star of that show. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I could, I could definitely see that. And don't give him more... Um, credit though. <laughs> no, no, no. I'll just inflame his ego even more. <laughs> that handsome little critter. Right. So, um, how is how do the people who live on different realms travel throughout the tree or within the tree? So, that's. I mean, you travel down the tree essentially. Um, in my head it's kind of like a system of like vine like vines and i think gym class and the rope climb in my head um but there is actually a a myth about ethun um where she actually falls off the tree and she kind of is i'm not really sure 
can't remember exactly why she just lays there. I think she it, she's injured somehow, but she becomes very depressed and very like she she eventually has to get rescued by her husband. Um, and they it's it's this very in, like very I'm not, not really sure what the point of that story was, but it's kind of interesting to think that you could fall off the tree. Um, but yeah, at the, at going the like a no man's land. Yeah. Um, but it said that she ends up getting covered by like snow and le like dead leaves and it's just like a bunch of, uh, you don't really think it when you look at, when you think about the world tree, you just think of like a tree that's kind of suspended in cosmology and not that it really has like a base because then that opens up a lot of other questions. It's, okay. Well, what's on the base? Is it just like this one little base that's encompassing the tree mm -hmm. or what else is going on there? But, um, at the, at the base of the tree, you do have the roots, um, which kind of goes off into its whole own little thing. We have the first root, which is watered by Erd's well. Um, that's where the Norns live, which they're the, the weavers of fate. Um, and they actually carry water from Erd's well to the root and water the root from the well. So that's kind of a, kind of a neat thing. Um, and then you have the second root, which is, um, watered by Mimir's well, sorry, excuse me. Um, and that is the same well that Odin sacrifices his eye and, and that's where Mimir resided before getting traded to the Vanaheim, um, to the, to the Vanir. Uh, and then you have the third root, which is rooted in hell. Uh, and it's watered by the well Virgilmir, which is kind of of like this bubbling boiling well which doesn't sound like it'd be very good for a tree but I mean each one of its roots is watered by a well from one of the realms so that's that's an interesting concept um, especially because you have Mimir's well which is knowledge and then you have Erd's well which is you know the well of, of, of the Norns and then you have the the well of the dead which i think is really interesting to see how we kind of tie that together it just it doesn't it doesn't seem like it should go together but it does so that's kind of an interesting part of the root of Yggdrasil. I like it. It, it. It's definitely a, I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it is a big dichotomy when you, when you think about it, but I mean, you kind of have to have the good with the evil to, to make things turn. I was just thinking you need the nutrients and the acid and the, well, yeah, that like too. the, 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 the bu bubbling and boiling might just be like all of the nutrients of the dead, because we know for that mm -hmm. a body is a great source of nutrients for plants. So. Which is another aspect that you could, think of it's like okay well it's the well of the dead and dead things actually give a lot of life to not dead things yeah right so yeah. and it it also brings back that whole you know lion king circle of life thing mm -hmm. <laughs> right so be and another interesting thing about hell is it doesn't just contain dead people it also has dead gods like the god balder mm -hmm. um, he resides there until ragnarok um, where he, you know, is, is revived and, and, um, goes on to do whatever happens after Ragnarok. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Do what, what must be done. Right. And, and his, his wife, who is also a, a goddess lives there as well. So it's not necessarily just, oh, a hall of dead people. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I, I like the idea of thinking that, you know, I'll still have Torby with me when, um, when I do die, if I end up in Helheim, um, my sweet little dog, which I've mentioned on our break, um, because I just, I, I don't think that any life, even an afterlife would be complete without your pets, totally but agree. that's my opinion. 
I, I definitely could not live without something furry greeting me at the door when I come home. Mm -hmm. It would be a very bleak existence. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I've had that existence and I don't like it. No. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the general overview of Yggdrasil. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting to me that you see Yggdrasil a lot and it's, you know, not always by that name. Um, oh, and then it's really common, especially around here in Flagstaff and Sedona, you see a lot of artistic depictions of a tree with its roots. I actually have a necklace that has, um, I call it Yggdrasil, but they just call it the world tree. And you actually see a lot of that in a lot of different cultures that they have this tree that supports life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I mean, it's definitely uh, even, even down here, it's, it's big in the pagan community. It's just a, a, a just a mm -hmm. big symbol of life in general. Right. Which also is interesting because, um, because it is, you know, the tree is life, but then we also have the, the myth of Odin sacrifice. He hangs himself from Yggdrasil for, you know, nine days in order to, to collect the secrets of the runes. Um, so it's interesting because at the same time as the tree is life, the tree was almost death for Odin. But does, is Odin really going to die by hanging himself on a tree? Yeah. But <laughs> in, in, the, in the mythology, you know, he was on the brink of death and that's when the that's when the mystery of the runes spoke to him when he was on the brink of death. But he wasn't necessarily sacrificing himself to the tree. He sacrifices himself to himself for this knowledge. And there's a whole lot of psychology behind that that could be really, really interesting. Oh, yeah. Um, for those who are, who are interested in a, uh, the psychological breakdown of that myth. Um, but it's just, you know, the the tree houses so much life and death and good and bad. It is, the tree is the true neutral of everything, um, which is nice in a way, you know, because it can't be, you can't have something house all of the realms and be just one or the other because we have people who are good and bad. We have the gods who they, yeah, they're gods, but you know what? Sometimes they're assholes. Sorry, they're not nice. Um, no, it, they, um, so I, it's just, you can't house all of that and not be a neutral, in my opinion. And so I like the concept of the world tree because it is that, you know, you have the whole concept of new, uh, what is it? chaotic neutral all of that but it really is the true neutral mm -hmm. which i i like yeah right so well thank you so much again tasha for coming back to us we're going to go ahead and say thank you to our patreon supporters there is a good number of them so thank you kim and marco and katie and mel and evelyn Yay, Yay, thank, thank you, you thank for you being everyone. Patreon supporters. Mm. Yay. Um, so I know on Facebook we posted that we're going to have kind of a wacky schedule. Uh, if you're listening to this on the day it came out, it is the um, da, 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 17th of June. Our next episode, the mini-sode, will be coming out on the 27th, and that is it for June. Uh, we will have a full episode releasing on the 1st of July. Um, this is just kind of us having a little bit of a crazy schedule getting back in from being on our COVID break and also Jara is getting older. Yeah. So I got, got my birthday coming up. We had to um, adjust for that. So um, actually we don't see each other until after your birthday, don't we? Yeah, no, we, we record the mini. So I think the week, uh, weekend after. Oh, so well, yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> Give it to you. We should do it to him. Uh oh. Happy, happy birthday. It's your favorite day. Happy, happy birthday. It's your special day. Ha! Ow.
That was loud. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you. And uh, I mean, you know, uh, you guys are, are invited to, well, I mean, this episode's going to come out afterwards, but you guys know that you're invited to my, uh, my online birthday party. So. Yeah. How old are you now? Oh God, I'm going to be 35. Ooh. Children, oh. all of you. <laughs> Some guy teased what like, if, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> I'm turning 31 in July. Ooh, uh, th- 31 was a good year. I'm hoping it's going to be a good year. Yeah. I mean, a lot of, I, I feel like most of my years are good years, but this one's kind of up in the air. 30 has been a little rough. Yeah. Right? I'm like, why? I, th- I had expectations. So many expectations. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you know, the world changing is, is a good, a good thing to come about, right? Yeah. yeah. But hey, now change, I got- Change is needed. I, yes. got, I got more time to work on cosplays because they, they rescheduled our- uh, comic-con till september so mm-hmm. got some extra time and i'm sure a lot of people on the um east coast know that mystic south was canceled so obviously i will not be coming to atlanta next month to visit anybody so keep your fingers crossed that i am able to get there next year and maybe even we can i can do something um a panel about the podcast or something like that so yeah. i'll be trying to reach out to them planning things a little bit better <laughs> other than i'm just here it's fine I'll, I'll even see if i can i can maybe make it out you know oh you, you've never experienced humidity no no it's true i haven't <laughs> i've barely been outside of arizona for more than more than a week at a time <laughs> <sighs> so he'll be I'm a sweaty going. nest <laughs> you've been to atlanta you're fine <laughs> sound guy to you saying no he refuses. So thank you again, Tasha. And thank you all of our listeners. So um, if you have any other things that you want us to talk with Tasha about, about heathenism or um, Astro True, please give us a shout out on our Facebook page, our Patreon, or our Instagram. Um, you can either find those as Pagan Pod or Millennial Pagan Podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you wanted to watch this episode after listen, listening to it, we're on YouTube at Millennial Pagan Podcast. Uh, Tasha, how do we find uh, find you online? For those for those that uh, want to like so look at you the can, blog. So I have my Instagram, um, which is Tasha Baker official. I have Facebook, Tasha Baker. Um, I'm usually one of the first people that pops up. Um, and then if you are interested in reading my blog, you can find me on WordPress. It's Ancient Traditions for the Modern Heathen. Um, so that's how you find me. And then that magazine that you're editing now. And then, uh, yeah, if you are interested in learning more, the Austria community always has some really great information, but I will be having my article coming out in this summer's edition of Mimir as well, the Austria community's magazine. And then is that all, is that all thing public or is that just for those three, um, groups? So as far as I know right now, it's kind of, it, it's private-ish, but if, I know that if there are people who are willing to go, I can talk to the, uh, to the person who's holding the event. Her name is Elania. Me and her are really great friends. Um, and I'm sure that she's more than willing to have more people. She really enjoys bringing the heathen community together. So if that is something that some people, there, some people are interested in. Um, I'm more than willing to talk to Elenia to see if she, you know to just to make sure that she can accommodate a growing number. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So reach out to you to figure that one out. Yeah, and yeah. how do people find you? Uh, of course, uh, I got my Twitter uh, at Jarrah Stone, and of course, Hagrid Hagrid cosplay on Instagram. And you can find me on our Instagram at Millennial Pagan Podcast or Pagan Pod. And I'm on Facebook as Autumn Wolf and Twitter as Autumn Wolf. Yeah. So uh, thank you. Thank you again, Tasha, for cutting out some time and and uh, zoom in with us. Zoom in with us. <laughs> having me. I, I really um, enjoyed it as always. Yay. Yeah. And from all of us here at Millennial Pagan Podcast, Mary Meet. Mary Park. And, and Mary, Mary Meet again. again.